Yes, the only time a European had won the men's 1500 metres world title was when Britain's Steve Cram did so at the first ever World Athletic Championships back in 1983. Now, on Tuesday, it was another Brit, Jake Whiteman, who broke Europe's barren spell. The 28-year-old ran a world-leading 3 minutes 29.2 seconds to 3 seconds to beat the Olympic champion Jakob Ingebrigtsen in the enthralling contest you just saw. Now, what made the occasion even more special for the Brit was that the person calling the race live inside the stadium was none other than his dad, Jeff Whiteman. Whiteman Sr. spoke about the moment he felt his son had the gold medal in his grasp. And that was his mom you just saw there. Whiteman was cheered on by some of his teammates in Eugene with the sprinter Asher Phillip uh, posting uh, this video on uh, Twitter. <laughs> Yeah, what a day for the Whiteman family. The day also saw four Caribbean athletes progressing to the finals of their respective events. Trinidad and Tobago's Jareem Richards, they call him the Dream, was the only Caribbean competitor advancing to the men's 200-meter final, clocking 19.86 in his semifinal heat for third behind the United States duo of Noah Lyles and Kenneth Bednarek. On the women's side, the three Jamaicans who swept the medals in the 100 meters all made it through to the final of the 200 meters. Sherika Jackson is the fastest qualifier, while Shelly and Fraser Price progressed comfortably. There are concerns about the medal prospects of Olympic champion Elaine Thompson Hira, who could only manage third in her heat. And joining us for a rolling analysis of the action in with uh, that's been happening in Track Town is Leighton Levy. Leighton, welcome back to the Sports Max Zone. And um, it was a white Monday yesterday, wasn't it? A quick comment on that before we talk about the Caribbean aspect. Really like that race. I mean, it wasn't as electric as the women's 1500 the night before, but it was still compelling to watch how white man is, you know, use that strategy, came on the shoulder of Inga Britson and then took the lead at just the right time and, and came home strong. Because when you take the lead against somebody who can close like Inga Britson, you want to ensure that you're going to be able to stay in front of him. And that's exactly what he did. And of course, you know, a quick, quick background here. His, he has a lot of history in his family. His DNA is filled with people. That inspiration is there for him. So, you know, it was a very well-deserved victory. And of course, another seminal moment in these championships. Yeah, and looking at the 200-meter events, Leighton, we were talking yesterday about the prospects of Jareem the Dream. And um, he did reasonably well yesterday, but the Americans again looking strong. The Americans look really, really strong. I mean, you have to give them credit. I mean, area 9, 1977. And people forget that he's just he just turned 18 in January. So he's 18 and a half, just over 18 and a half. And he's running these ridiculous times, 19.77. And we expect him to go fast, of course. Now, Elias, 19.6. Bednarek, 19.83. You kind of expect the Americans to, 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 to sweep the, sweep the medals, as I think has been expected throughout the, you know, leading up in the championships. But I still believe that Jerry Richards has a shot, though small. I'm, I'm probably breaking it up because had he come off that curve a little bit better yesterday, he probably would have caught Bednarek a little bit earlier. Because as you as you realize, they came down, they came down to mere hundreds of a second on the line. And that's all you need. So maybe we can shave a few, a few hundreds off his time going into the final when the pressure of the final itself and the expectation on the Americans performing before their home crowd, maybe, maybe he can sneak in. You never can tell. Yes, Leighton, and at the top of the show, you know, we spoke about the juicy 200-meter um, woman, of course. Uh, I know yesterday we spoke about Sharika Jackson and, of course, the fact that she's a favorite. What about the other prospects? And I also want you to comment on Elaine and the fact that, you know, she placed the third and, you know, a bit of contribu controversy. 
Um, well, one of the things that we became clear yesterday is that Shelly and Fraser Price have been playing possum with her 200 meter running. 22 1 for the national championships. She looked the most vulnerable of the Jamaicans going into the world championships for the 200. But as we saw yesterday, she's probably this next best athlete other than Sherika Jackson. And as we know, Shelly and Fraser Price is a warrior. Panels don't, you know, intimidate her any at all. So, you know, as she spoke afterwards about this, that she's not in the speed endurance that we saw last year in Tokyo is not there this year. And she's probably a little bit short of work. She was very winded after the 200 meters, 21.97. Good time nonetheless, the season best. But when you consider that Tamara Clark and, of course, Dinasha Smith, 21.95 and 21.96 respectively, along with Abby Steiner, I think Elaine is very vulnerable right now. And I think if she can perhaps shave somewhere between 0 0.05 and a tenth of a second, maybe she can hold on to third. But she's going to have to run her very best to hold off the other three ladies I just mentioned, because if not, she's not she's going to find herself without a medal, given the fact that, you know, at the 2015 World Championship, she ran 26, 21, 66, which was one of the fastest times of a run in history, and of course, one of the fastest times running in Jamaica. That was before Sharika Jackson and herself last year, 2053, and of course, 2055 this past June. Um, right now, the most vulnerable Jamaican is, unfortunately, the Olympic champion. Yeah. And Leighton, just one more thing before I pass on to George. Uh, Shelley, in her post-race uh, interview, of course, was asked about the world athletic schedule, and I found, you know, her comments to be very, very stinging, speaking about, you know, how tight it is and also pointing to the fact that there seems to be a sort of bias where the men, you know, getting a bit more rest time versus the women. Um, I don't know if it's a bias, but what it is that traditionally, after you run the 100 meters, you do get a day's rest before you compete in the 200. Women got no rest. She ran Fraser Price, for example. She went to, she got to her Airbnb at after 3 a.m. on the night of the 100 meter finals to get up early the next morning to, you know, to compete in the, uh, you know, to start preparation for the 200 meters um, first round of competition while the men were off. And of course, they got, the women got the day off today, um, but then the men also get another day off tomorrow. So I think it's something that they probably, I don't know if it's an oversight, but I think it's something that they need to look at, at the scheduling because it, it's unfair when the women run the, run the last event on the night of the 100-meter finals and they had to come back again to run the 200-meter heats the next day. It's um, it's unfortunate. Can't speak to the the, in, the the motive behind it, but it's it's unfortunate. And I think it's something that World Athletics needs to look at in terms of the scheduling. Yeah, we're going to talk 400 meters hurdles late and the, and the, the observation you made yesterday. But just before we do that, I asked you about my guy yesterday and uh, you, you were kind in your comments, but you didn't really think that Joseph Fanboule would have gotten a lane in the final. But voila, the big man from Liberia is in. Absolutely, John. As I said, you know, I think if he ran at his best, he probably would be in there. But he ran really well yesterday. Of course, we know he traditionally he runs from behind. But given the NCAA season that he had, I figured that maybe, like we've seen like the many other athletes before who were um, competitive in the NCAA season that ended early June, the, 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 this championship was a little bit too early for some of them, many of them, and of course, and their legs just couldn't hold up to the competition. But Fambole looks really awesome and came through run, and ran really well. I think he you know, finished second in his... In his yes, in his a fast finish in second. Yeah, and which is, which is typical of him. And, you know, given what we've seen, maybe it's the fresh enough for him to do something spectacular. Who knows? I mean, I like the idea of him doing well. I'm just wondering if this is going to be one race too many for him. And, you know, you, 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 you have to weigh, you have to weigh the, the, what's in front of you. Um, and what's in front of me tells me that the Americans are going to be too deep. And perhaps Jerry Richards also um, that might be a little bit too fast for him. But I think it's a really good campaign so far notwithstanding, you know, the, the, the potential of fatigue in those legs. Yeah, and, and the one thing we're sure of given running style is that he'll be doing his best work late in the event. The other men are yep. fast, but he'll be going going from the from the gun, but he'll be, be, be finishing late. Just before in the 400 meters hurts late, there, there's another thing that I wanted to take up with you. The issue of the starts at these world championships. We've heard a lot of complaints among fans about the, the, the starts and people getting false starts when they weren't false starting. And of course, the Devon Allen situation uh, brought many people to say, well, 
he got up uh, right with the gun and you know that proves that he should have been allowed to compete because he got up right at the same time and I was saying to myself well from the definition of what a start is and how a start is governed an athlete who gets up with the gun has fall started from my understanding Leighton, because isn't it true that the athlete is supposed to respond to the report of the gun. Of the gun. Then if, yeah. you, if you get up with the gun, clearly you have not yet heard the report of the gun. So in my estimation, that's a false start. Yeah, and, and of course the, the rule, um, I think a few years ago, the, the reaction time limit was 0 0.120. It was even based on data that they, they had collected, they lowered it to 0 0.100, right? And while those false starts are not visible to the naked eye, to the computer that's attached to the starting blocks and the starting system, if you react faster than that 1.100, you're, you're a rule to have, you know, false started. And it's unfortunate because I think it's also a TV thing where well, the, the one false start thing, which is, um, you know, designed for television because they claim it was taking up too much time, all of these false starts. The thing is, George, yeah, we understand the elements of television and, and the time constraints that are involved in that. But when you look at what it is, regardless of the circumstance, the athletes still have to get back in the blocks, right? So the delay is inevitable. So, I, you know, I think I need to look at... But, but my friend, but my friend, there is no perfect situation because we've tried no, several things before. When, okay, yeah. you got one fast start, so you know, inevitably, somebody was going to fast start to try to get the fast starters to sit in the block. So there's no perfect I, situation. I, yeah, no, you're right, you're right. But I don't know, I, I just think, I don't know. Well, you know, it is what it is. I, I guess I'll leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> Dos Santos, no, you said to me yesterday that George, right, Benjamin, our man with the Antiguan roots, the son of the Windy's fast Winston bowler, Winston Benjamin. Benjamin. He was paying attention to the wrong man. He shouldn't have bothered wasting time watching Karsten Varholm, who was essentially what you said, because you yep. said the tall man from Brazil was set to run the rivals, run rivals into the ground. And that Alison dos Santos did in emphatic style, championship record style. Yeah, and of course, you know, one of the interesting things about the race is that, as I said, and I expected, he blew down the back stretch like a hurricane and then came on the top of the stretch. And surprisingly, Varhom was right there with him. The thing is, as we said, I said yesterday as well, Varhom looked a little short of work. Had he had a couple of races before this, probably would have been different. But he just simply ran out of steam after that, uh, after as they came on the top of the stretch, and and of course, Ryan Benjamin spending his time watching Barholm, didn't see San De Santos pulling away down the stretch, 46-29, still the third fastest time in history, but a big PB um, in terms of his prone performance down from the 46-72 that he ran at the Olympics last year, and he's a legitimate right now. He's in my mind, legitimately the real contender to, to Carson Barholm, of course. Right, Benjamin is always going to be there. And of course, we hear that he's probably going to be doing surgery again, like he did um, last year, coming into the championships injured, running 46 89 is still incredible. But as Alison Dos Santos right now has proven himself to the, be the, 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 produ the, the, the producer has blown the whistle on the segment, Layton, but I have to ask you this before we go. I credit Alison Dos Santos for Jahil Hyde's personal best because Jahil Hyde, knowing who was behind him, I think he just went hard. And by the time Dos Santos passed him, which was relatively early, he still maintained that to, to an extent down the street. And that's how he got his personal best. Absolutely. And as I said yesterday as well, you know, aiming for personal best was probably his best ambition there. Because he's now the third fastest Jamaican all time behind Winthrop Graham's 47-60 from 1993, the World Championship to 93. And of course, the great Danny McFarlane, 48 flat. Jair Hyde, I have to publicly apologize to him now because... I've always said that he should have chosen the sprint hurdles as opposed to the 400 meter hurdles. But he's gradually improved, and right now he's on the cusp of 47 seconds, which I think will make him competitive on the circuit, and perhaps <coughs> over time make him competitive at these championships as well. Yeah, Woolmer's man is producing us, and Woolmer's man is beside me on the set. Big up Jahil Hyde and his Woolmer's collections. Thank you very much, Mr. Knox College. All the best to you. Take it easy, guys. Good, good, good. Break time here on the Sports Mark Zone. Back with more after these. Stay with Sportsmax on YouTube and follow us on all social pages for updates, news and entertainment. <laughs>